Sea Press has, has contacted me to um, update them. So they're, they're going to come in pretty useful then, you know, to, you know, cross-checking facts and um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. perhaps digging out information which had, which had not been previously published, you know, which... Hello and welcome to another of our uh, Zypher Jazz Days uh, discussion panel. Uh, we welcome from a beautiful European Music Center, uh, Krzysztof Penderecki's, uh, Professor Stuart Nicholson, a uh, world-leading authority on jazz, author of several books and publications, biographies of Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday, Etc. Etc. And Mr. Andreas Felber, uh, working now for Austrian National Broadcasting Corporation, head of jazz, pop, and world music there, music journalist, musicologist, uh, gentlemen. Uh, basically, we'd like to know if we here in Poland, uh, studying Komedas and Seifert's music, are biased, are not objective, because we are insiders. So it's very interesting for us to have opinions from the outside. Uh, let's start uh, with your Komeda and Zeifert music story. When you first heard them, uh, what was your reaction? What's your opinion now? Professor Nicholson. Well, uh, I first came into contact with uh, Christopher Komeda some, some while ago, um, I think going back in to the 1980s, maybe late 1970s, 
um, and that, that was from um, a Thomas Stanko album called Music for Kay. And quite coincidentally, um, it had uh, uh, Seifert and, um, uh, on it, and of course, Music for Kay was Christoph Kameda. Um, and that's when I started doing a little bit of digging because I've always been very interested in the detail of European jazz because there's not just one jazz history, uh, you know, the history of jazz in America. Um, it, the, the, every nation has its own individual um, jazz history. I've got a, a jazz history in, a, in the books behind me, um, a jazz history of Azerbaijan, for example. And that's quite a thick volume and, and that, that is quite detailed. And uh, it's absolutely fascinating how uh, the music spread, usually, you know, by record, uh, and then followed by touring American bands, and then it is, it's a sort of a cultural appropriation on, on the part of, um, you know, the local jazz musicians to absorb um, and try and play like the Americans, and then there seems to reach a point where some musicians feel, well, you know, I'm not an American, I, I want to, I want to put my own cultural identity of who I am and where I am in the world. And that was the thing that fascinated me about um, Christoph Kameda, uh, particularly because he, he, he brings a, a kind of, uh, he, he, he does what Chopin and, and, and people and, and, and musicians who have uh, followed in the classical uh, tradition by bringing in elements of, of uh, the Polish uh, culture and, 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 and so forth. And that, that was particularly interesting to me because of course, more obviously and more highly, more highly publicized is the, the same thing going on in, for example, um, Norway and Sweden and, and, uh, and the Scandinavian countries who, um, who, who have governments who have got behind uh, their jazz scene and, and, and use it as an aspect of cultural diplomacy. Um, and subsidize their artists touring around the world and see great value, you know, in, in, in the culture which they have to offer in their countries, you know, which are, uh, you know, in the case of Norway is actually quite a small country um, in terms of population. Um, and so, so all, all these aspects were, were coming together and it was absolutely fascinating that, that um, uh, this was happening in Poland as well. Um, and uh, thanks to, um, uh, Pavel Budowski, um, I managed to get a grant to come across to Poland and under his auspices um, he took me around to places like Sopot and, and uh, Krakow and, and various uh, places around Poland um, to, to hear the jazz speak to you know, jazz musicians and, and, and so on and so forth and of course meet Thomas Stanko. Uh, where um, he was able to tell me about his his own personal experiences with Christoph Kameda and and how the music from his perspective playing it uh, evolved. So that was a very interesting experience. And then, uh, as, as as far as uh, this big news was, was concerned, um, in in around about uh, 1996 97, uh, I decided to write. Uh, a book, a jazz hit, uh, history of jazz rock, uh, because I've just come off a biography of Billie Holiday, and that was very, very depressing. And I hadn't realised I was actually depressed, living with, a, with with this lady for, for for two and a half years, going to bed with her, metaphorically with her, her story going around in my mind, and it's a very depressing story ultimately, as we all know. And I thought to cheer myself up, I'll write a history of jazz rock. Uh, which had the desired uh, medicinal effect. Um, and uh, I was very interested um, because I, I, I was fascinated by the playing of Jean uh, Luc Ponty. And then I, I stumbled across uh, Zigmu, um, uh, and I, I th I'm pretty certain the album uh, was Kilimanjaro that I, I, I came across. And, 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 and most unusually, I came across it in, the, in, in, in an American second-hand vinyl shop <laughs> of all places. Uh, and um, I took it back uh, and, and started listening to it. And then I got um, his Capital album. I don't think it had a title, just Zygmunt Ziefert. Yeah. Um, and, and 
it, it, it was a source of you know great fascination to me um, hearing how he translated um, the ideas of John Coltrane onto um, onto um, the violin. Um, at that stage, I didn't have any recordings of him on saxophone, but um, and I suppose the difference between for me the two. Um, Christoph Kameda and, and, and Zygmunt Seifert is, is that perhaps Zygmunt uh, doesn't quite reflect in the same way uh, the, 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 the kind of, you know, Polish culture it, it, it is, is not necessarily to the fore in the same way as, as I would associate that with um, the playing of, uh, uh, of Kameda and indeed, you know, his musicians, you know, sort of, um, uh, particularly Thomas Stanko, so that was that. That was how I came into contact with them, and um, and I think I've written a couple of you know pieces uh, to, to, that appeared in the European Jazz Press, uh, certainly Jazz Forum uh, under, under the auspices of Bar Barbara, uh, where I did a sort of sort of like an in-depth study of, of uh, Christoph Kameda. Uh, so. We're trying to spread the word beyond Poland <laughs> about, about his wonderful achievements. Thank you very much. Dr. Felber, what's your story? Um, my story with the music of Christoph Kaveda and with speaking as Seifert is, um, of course, different than the one of Stuart. I um, um, thought about it before um, this panel um, started and when I got in the, in the invitation to this panel. Um, to start with Christoph Komeda, I actually read about him before I listened to his music. Joachim Ernst Behrendt, the German jazz producer, uh, wrote about Christoph Komeda in one of his books. It's called Ein Fenster aus Jazz or a window um, uh, made out of jazz or a window through jazz, some kind of that. And he remembered Christoph Komeda well as an important person in the Polish jazz scene um, and beyond. And that was the first time I heard his name. Um, second was to hear not Christoph Komeda playing himself, but um, listening to musicians who played his compositions. Um, foremost, it was Tomasz Stanko. Um, I was in Warsaw, I think about 20 years ago, when his album Britannia uh, was published by ECM, where he uh, paid um, homage to Christoph Komeda. And uh, he, uh, of course, um, liked to remember his time in the quintet of Komeda in the 60s. And uh, then I got familiar with the very beautiful compositions he did for the Roman Polanski um, film scores. And then the third stage was to uh, really um, uh, listen to Christoph Komeda himself, to Astigmatic, the record he did in the 1960s, and to be really impressed by him, um, especially as a, comp um, uh, as a composer. Um, so this was my way, in a way, to, these were the stages of approaching Christoph Komeda. With uh, Spignev Seifert, it was, um, as far as I remember, different. Um, in the 1970s, after the split up of the Thomas Stanko Quintet, he played in the group Free Sound of Austrian saxophone player Hans Koller for two years. And as I knew Hans Koller, and, I'm, and I have uh, done many broadcasts on his music, he celebrated it, he would have celebrated his 100th birthday this year. Um, so I also got familiar with Spignel Seifert. There's this record Kunstkopf Indiana, where Spignel Seifert is a part of Hans Koller's group. Um, so this was my beginning. Of course, I read about him and about his um, also tragic life and his uh, much too early death. But that I became more familiar with his music. I think I have to say it was only during the last years during the recent years, um, also through activities of the Speaking of Seifert Foundation in Russia. Um, I got some CDs. Um, I was, I think I, I knew Man of the Light before, 
but um, to dig deeper, it was during the last years. And uh, for example, I will never forget when I listened for the first time to the um, solo violin record, which impressed me very much and it still impresses me very much. I'm not sure if it was the first solo violin record in jazz at all, but I think one of the first in general. Yeah. So yes, I hope that makes sense to answer your question. So these were the stages to approach uh, the music of and the persons and the lives of Christoph Kometa and Svidnir Seifert. You touched on the uh, solo violin album of Seifert. Uh, I was to ask uh, you both gentlemen about uh, the unique values of the two musicians. And I think one of them would be how brave it was to, to make a solo violin record at the time, right, Mr. Nicholson? Well, absolutely. Um, but uh, on the ECM label, um, Manfred Eicher, who of course played, formerly played uh, the double bass, had given the opportunity to a couple of bass players to, to, to record um, uh, solo albums on, on, on double bass. Um, and, and so the, the, the idea of using string instruments uh, prior to that was, was sort of in the air, I would have thought, because um, uh, in anything that ECM was doing at, 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 at that time, people were very interested in it as a label and in terms of their production values and who they were signing and what kind, kind of music they were doing. Um, so I, it, 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 it certainly wasn't without precedent, but um, it, it, it was certainly uh, a, a, an album of, of uh, great interest, I think, um, for the reasons which you state, you know, who, who would got the courage to, to do a solo violin album and not make it like sound like one enormous cadenza. And, uh, I think uh, that 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 I think is the the, the triumph of it that it, that has a bit of beginning, a middle, and an end. It, it, it takes you on, on on a sort of a journey, a musical journey, albeit a fragmented journey, of course, you know. Um, but but it, it 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 is an absorbing listen, and and I think for those who uh, you know um, attention spans is always a problem in this day and age. But but for those who uh, can sit down and listen to it from beginning to an end to, 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 to uh, the end is uh, would be greatly rewarded by listening to it because there's so many facets that come out uh, uh, in his playing. You know, um, probably you know um, I mentioned before his love of Coltrane, but, um, but but also this wonderful lyricism he, he has. You know, when he doesn't sort of refer back to you know Coltrane, Coltrane patterns which fall quite easily into the jazz rock kind of category. He, he becomes more, more lyrical and, uh, and, and as I say, you know, if, 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 if people can overcome the, uh, the attention span thing, it, it is a rewarding listen um, because there, there's very little value, I think, with, with an album like that in just picking out one track and saying, oh, right, I've heard solo valid violin album. It needs to be seen as, 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 as with the sort of uh, cultural event that I think he had at the back of his mind, I'm sure, when, when he made it. Uh, it's interesting because it's our third day of panel discussions, and every time when we discuss Seifert, uh, a spirit of Coltrane comes up. And yeah. uh, some say that uh, probably trying to translate the Coltrane soul or spirit into violin, uh, Seifert arrived at solo violin. Just for this very reason, Mr. Fodor, what's your opinion? Uh, sorry, can you can you ask the question again? You mean um, uh, concerning transformation of the influence of Coltrane? Uh, yes. so, so, something that translating soul and spirit of Coltrane's music into violin, Seifert arrived at playing solo violin just to make it, you know, fuller. Uh, maybe the, the interesting thing is for me, um, of course, this story is uh, told over and over again. And of course, Seifert um, said it himself that uh, John Coltrane uh, was his big hero and he wanted to sound like John Coltrane first on the saxophone 
and then yes also on the violin i have to admit when i listen to um speaking of cypher on the violin i don't hear that much john coltrane especially the before mentioned record um solo violin i hear more the classical background of speaking of cypher i hear um um uh a musician with a very, very rich palette of um, timbres, of sounds, of colors. Um, I hear the rich heritage of his classical music training, and that in combination with a wonderful mind for um, um, epic forms, in a way. So he, um, to me, it, uh, it seems that he knows in every second exactly what to do. There's no um, sound in a way without a very special meaning. So, um, of course, the, the influence of Coltrane is sometimes, I can, you, can, you can listen to it, you can hear it sometimes, but um, in relation to how often it's mentioned, um, because it's mentioned nearly in every biography, nearly in every short um, uh, summary about speaking of Seifert. In relation to that, I don't hear that much John Coltrane in his violin playing, I have to admit. Well, that's, that's an interesting point, uh, certainly. Could we touch a bit about the 60s and the politics and the pre-internet age? Because uh, we're talking about two musicians, 60s and 70s, with, uh, as you said yourself, unique European or Polish uh, flavor. Now, do you think the European jazz was uh, having this identity of, you know, Scandinavia and Norway and Poland? Also because we were in a pre-communication age. No internet, no uh, an iron curtain. Did that in fact, uh, helped makes the music unique. Um, oh, dropped out, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. oh, gee, yes, yes, yes. Uh, we, we, lost, we lost you there. Um, if, if you could just, just uh, okay, okay. rewind, uh, just, just a paragraph, perhaps. Uh, I was touching on the 60s and 70s story and the uniqueness of European and Polish jazz and those two musicians. And my question was, do you think that in the pre-internet age, pre-communication age, uh, the individual languages of jazz in Norway, Sweden, Poland, Germany, uh, were quite apart from the American ones because we were kind of enclosed in our own world? Well, let me let me answer that to 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 in, in a way which I th I think you meant because once again, um, unfortunately, you, you dropped out. But um, if we're talking about the pre-internet internet age, we need to go back you know, quite quite a bit further than that because national identity was being was being was surfacing in, in certainly in Swedish jazz uh, uh, in the United Kingdom um, in in France. Uh, because this, you know, in the 1930s and the 19 and the early 1940s, that was, you know, jazz was music for dancing, it was music for entertainment, and whilst a, a lot of uh, orchestras would be playing, you know, the current American hits, uh, towards the end of the evening, particularly in Sweden, uh, people wanted jazzed up versions of their local folk tunes and. and uh, local melodies that they would sing at the bar and, and this, this kind of thing. So this kind of uh, nationalization uh, of, 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 of jazz was take, taking place um, at, at, at a very uh, superficial level, just to, uh, uh, you know, in, in the terms of, in terms of um, entertainment rather than, you know, a conscious effort to sound Swedish. It was just to keep the, the, the customers satisfied. Um, when we go into the 1950s, uh, certainly in um, uh, 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 Europe, I mean, I can't, can't really speak about Poland, but certainly across Europe at this time, everyone was eagerly following uh, America in terms of uh, 
the values that they were uh, projecting into the world, you know, from films, books, plays, uh, and, and television programs which were being shown, uh, you know, across Europe. Um, so, uh, and we were willingly accepting uh, consumerism, you know, and the rise of the motor car, because certainly in the United Kingdom in the, in the 1940s, very few people really owned a car. It wasn't a, a common thing. Um, but by the middle to end of the 1950s, you know, it, this had become quite a common uh, occurrence. And, and this was happening all over Europe because uh, everyone was recovering from the war and so on and so forth. And consumerism was a way of both bolstering uh, trade, you know, both internally from internal manufacturers and uh, externally from importers. And uh, there was a, a willing acceptance up to that point of, 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 of American values, because that seemed to be the way of the future. But a, a dichotomy occurred, um, and this can be seen in, in jazz in, um, in, in the Netherlands, uh, in, in France, uh, to a lesser degree in, in the Scandinavian countries, but certainly in, in the United Kingdom, these values were, were beginning to be questioned by younger musicians who uh, were alarmed at the Vietnam War and America's uh, sometimes quite brutal uh, response to the civil rights protests and the Vietnam protests. Uh, and they began to sort of question well, you know, uh, is it right that we should be all Americanized in this way? And, and, and then, and, and, and certainly in the United Kingdom, for example, which is, you know, sort of a good example of this, people were consciously trying to sound um, British. Johnny Dankworth uh, in, in the, the, the regular uh, uh, weekly uh, musical newspaper that came out called Mel uh, Melody Maker. Um, pub published an article, our jazz should sound British, you know, it shouldn't sound American, we should go out of our way to, 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 to make, make it so. Uh, and, and certainly a um, pianist called Michael Garrick recorded several albums uh, and, and his autobiography, was the, the subtext was, uh, Dusk Fire was the name, but it was jazz in English hands. Uh, because he was he was he he, he was you know at the forefront of uh, trying to make jazz sound British. Um, the, the singer Norman Winston, who I'm, I'm sure uh, would be a name that's familiar to to many people, um, began to set, she made the conscious effort not to sing in an American way. You know, most people, most singers, you know, when they uh, sing standards and so forth, they tend to. to lapse into Americanisms and American pronunciations. Uh, but she made a conscious effort to sing uh, in a British accent, and so did the singer Cleo Lane, uh, John Dankworth's uh, uh, wife. And, and, and so you, you have um, in, in Holland, you, you have uh, jazz kaput, where they were taking out American influences completely, you know, and, and starting again from scratch. A sort of a reduction to ground zero in, in terms of free jazz. Um, it, it was done, I think, a little bit more subtly in, in, in terms of Scandinavian jazz because they, they, uh, Bent Ernie Wallin told, told me that he just got sort of fed up of playing American standards all the time. Um, and he and a pianist called Jan Johansson uh, started writing uh, and were encouraged to do so um, during uh, Quincy Jones's brief uh, residency in, in, in Sweden uh, to, 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 to write using local folkloric stuff and adapting it for jazz. So, so it, it is, I think it's a, it, it, it seemed less connected. Uh, it, 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 it seemed to be the zeitgeist of the time, you know, the, the spirit of the times, uh, rather than any conscious um, uh, this country have tried to sound, you know, uh, France are trying to sound French. Uh, we must try and sound English. It, it, it wasn't anything like that. It was just um, identity, and, and, and identity goes to the heart of who we are. Um, and th this is 
you know, we, we all we all want to project a specific identity of who we are, and, uh, our, and we are shaped by our own culture and our own values. And it's it's perhaps inevitable that, that this would come out in the music, you know, because after all, we had the rise of the nationalists um, in the period, you know, the late uh, 19th century going into the, t the 20th century. So, and, and once again, that was, you know, we don't want to keep sounding like, you know, the German, you know, we don't sound like Mozart and Brahms and Beethoven and, and so on. We embark, we, we, we want to have music which reflects our own culture, our own place in the world. And this is not unusual, you know. Um, uh, this, this was happening in, in all the arts, you know. Um, everyone was trying to ex express who they were uh, at a given place and a given time. So um, I don't see that, uh, that that would be unusual in, in, in Poland having reached a, a level of expertise, having mastered, having learned to speak the jazz language, then trying to adapt it with the, you know, in Kameda's case, you know, sort of Slavic uh, uh, romanticisms and so forth. Um, that, that I don't think would be out of context with what was happening, you know, right the way across Europe, you know, because why should he sound like an American, even though his first bands, you know, were you know, playing stuff by the modern jazz quartet and Miles Davis, he loved um, the, the number So What, for example, which got him interested in, in modal jazz. But uh, I, I, I think this is part of a broad picture. And, 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 and that picture is we are who we are. And, and, and jazz is music of expression. Um, and, and people wanted to express who they were uh, and their place in the world. So maybe that explains the success of Comedas and Seifert's music in the US, because they brought their uniqueness, the European, Polish, Slavic, whatever, uh, soul and spirit into America. That's why they made it there, Mr. Felber. I don't know. I'm a bit cautious concerning classifications of Slavic jazz or um, German jazz or Austrian jazz or whatever, because um, um, it's, a, it's a label that is put very easy on some music. And that um, I'm not sure if it's justified all the time. And it's, it's really about that. So um, I can hear some parts in the music of Polish jazz musicians that uh, uh, would fit into that genre or that would fit into that category. And, and I hear many other examples that would not fit. Um, from my perspective, from my point of view, I would say that uh, Christoph Komeda and Sidney Sarfet were um, very individual artists. Um, uh, Christoph Komeda was a very strong and very original composer. Um, concerning songs, concerning melodies, the, the, the compositions he did, he did for the film scores of Roman Polanski and of other um, uh, Polish filmmakers. Um, uh, he was a master of um, stretching of stretch forms. So the, the pieces on Astigmatic, for example, I think are 20 minutes and more. So, and it, it's always surprising, it's coherent and it's surprising at the same time. It makes a message as a composition and it gives room to the improviser, which is um, a big mastery for me. Um, speaking at Seifert, I would see him, um, he was also a fine composer, but I would see him more as a very, very strong, um, improviser and a very, very strong instrumentalist, especially on the violin. Um, when I hear his violin, um, I hear his classical background very much. Um, sometimes I can imagine some echoes also of um, Polish folk music, which can be um, seen or heard as some Slavic influence. Um, I would say, um, yes, I understand sometimes why it's classified like that, but I'm a bit cautious with um, those categories. Open. Can I just make a point here? Um, we, we were talking in the context really of, uh, you know, localized jazz, but um, 
all musicians have a, a, a decision to make because they initially learn the language of jazz and you know jazz education is, is, is pretty homogenized wherever you go um, uh, around the globe. Um, it, it tends to follow, broadly speaking, the, the modules which they, 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 they will use, tend to follow, broadly speaking, um, uh, American precedent. And it's a question really of, uh, you know, in, in the United Kingdom, there are a lot of, um, a lot of musicians who sound, who, who are quite happy to, to play in, in what we might call the sort of the more forthright uh, American style. Uh, and there are others who choose not to. I mean, for example, pianist Bobo Stenson uh, was the pianist of choice for Charles Lloyd, and he toured with Charles Lloyd and made several uh, highly acclaimed albums, you know, uh, with, with with Charles Lloyd, beginning with Fish Out of Water, uh, and and really enjoyed his time with with uh, with Charles Lloyd playing, you know, in and in commas, in an American style, which that's how he put it to me. Um, and uh, but he, he said when it came to making records under my own name, he he said he he said we we've got more going on here in Sweden. We we, we have a uh, you know, folklore tradition. We have a, a Swedish pop tradition. Um, you know, I I I have a great lover of classical music. And all these, on all these elements, as a kind of washing around his playing, you know, on albums, for example, like War Orphans, which which is a, a wonderful album, which you might which you might say, well, it, it is it tends to be a more local version of of, of uh, jazz than perhaps the Americanized version of um, his work with, with with Charles Lloyd. So all musicians have this the, these choices. Some arrive at it naturally. Some think, well. You know, it's been put to me by many musicians. You know, they 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 reach a point where mm, I, I I really don't want. I'm not an American. I wasn't brought up in Brooklyn. Why am I trying to sound like an American musician? And so, um, uh, you know, jazz exists in, in lots of schools. You know, there's you know, we still have big band jazz, for example. That continues. We, we have musicians who's predominantly interested in free jazz that continues we have musicians who play you know in the art making hard pop tradition that continues uh, and 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 really globalized musicians um, as I would put it are just another strand of that and there's certainly a strand within their own country uh, it's not that everybody in you know in 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 the United Kingdom suddenly started uh, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, the period which I was talking about, uh, you know, with the Vietnam War and the civil rights and, and so on. Um, it's not as if every musician decided, you know, but some did have a crisis of conscience and it is a matter of record that this happened. Uh, and they're quite outspoken about it. Um, but there were other musicians, for example, an alto saxophonist called uh, Peter King, Peter King, um, and he was praised and became very friendly with Chan Parker because his playing, according to Chan Parker, was most the person who most closely evoked Charlie Parker uh, to her. Uh, so obviously, you know. But that's where he wanted to take his jazz. That's what interested him, you know, extending the tradition of, of Charlie Parker. Then you have, you know, musicians who are fascinated in, you know, the music of John Coltrane, as, as, we've, as we've been talking about, but also uh, more, con in, more contemporaneously, uh, the music of Mike Brecker. And they, and that is a, a lifetime study in itself. And, and, and that's, that's how they, they, they you know, their, their main thrust uh, it, it, it's coming from. So there are all these strands, I, 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 and I, I, I certainly wouldn't claim that, um, uh, you know, all Norwegians play in a folkloric way, uh, because that would be a great insult to, to many accomplished musicians. There's a Lucy and, and, and people like that who, who, who don't want anything to do with it. They, they think that that 
type of jazz is old fashioned. Uh, they call it mountain music in Britain, or, you know, derisively, you know, oh, it's mountain music, it's all folk tunes, we don't that, you know, get out of here. Uh, so, so, you know, in, in, the, in the great jazz sort of, uh, uh, how would one call it, do, do you have the, the phrase trifle, you know, uh, uh, it sort of, you know, it's a, it's a mixture of jelly and, and uh, cut up fruit and peaches and uh, and bits of banana and, 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 uh, and all, all types of fruit, kiwi fruit, all chopped up. Uh, and with jelly is put all over the top and then a whole, uh, a whole whack of cream on top of that. And we laughingly call that trifle. Uh, uh, but that's what, that's what jazz is. You know, it, it, it's got lots, every mouthful you take, it's got a bit of this, a bit of that, and a bit of the other. Except that some people would consciously go down one route and others more consciously go down the other route. And, and I think that the diversity of jazz is something that should be celebrated, even though, you know, uh, the individual strands of, of, of jazz um, uh, taking on the, uh, I think one put it, a, a, a more national outlook, uh, that too is equally fascinating to me, you know, because. Uh, it, 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 it is actually a quiet kind of, um, how, how can one put it, um, a, a kind of um, evolution that, that it perhaps in its own way is perhaps as significant as, you know, in, in, in jazz history, you've had the big bands that, the, 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 uh, bebop, hard bop, cool jazz, free jazz, mole jazz, all these distinct periods, if you open up a jazz history book, are all kind of delineated and, and, uh, and, and I think that the most significant development in jazz that has occurred since, uh, I would say the 1970s, is, is, is this, this trend towards globalization. And that really isn't being acknowledged by, certainly by American historians, with the notable exception of Ted Joa, who, who has uh, taken account of, you know, my writings on the subject of the local scene and how it's, uh, you know, absorbed local influences. Um, I, I, th I think that that is, that is quite a sig significant development that, that has taken, uh, taken jazz um, Outside the outside of the uh, the United States, um, but you know, well, but even then, you know, not everyone is. As I, you know, I hasten to say, not everyone plays in a in a, in, a, in that type of style. They haven't made that specific artistic choice. And as you quite rightly say, you you hear musicians. Ah, yes, if I can hear you know something of this and something of that, and um, you know, Jan Garbrecht, for example, makes makes it very obvious what what he's doing in terms of using Nor Norwegian folk music on some some of his albums. Um, others perhaps more subtly so, you know, that we have a, the composer, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Tommy Smith, sa saxophonist, who's uh, the principal of the Scottish uh, National Jazz Orchestra. Uh, and he has incorporated um, elements of his own heritage, but within the framework of a sort of an American outlook, if I may put it that way. Um, he's, he's well aware of the work of Hamish McCrum, um, a Scots composer who, was, who came through during the, the period of the, uh, of the nationalists. Uh, so he's got a, a foot in both camps. Um, his first album uh, uh, as a young man for his debut on the Blue Note album uh, label many many years ago um, he, he, he even uh, was incorporating uh, subtle elements of uh, uh, Scots folkloric music but done um, through the prism almost of, of, of um, John Coltrane so to speak so there are lots of lots of ways that this is expressed and some subtle some not so subtle um, but as I say it, it when that jazz national is, is apparent, it's very apparent, recognizable by all, it can be subtle, but then 
right the way through, you know, jazz history, um, you know, with the rise of the big bands, you had, you still had New Orleans musicians playing and they continue to play to, to this day, developing quite apart from, you know, the, the, the American mainstream. Uh, you had the rise of the traditionalists in, in America, you know, around about, you know, 1938, 1939, um, uh, Wingy Lenone and his, his classic 16 albums, al uh, uh, tracks which he recorded. Um, so this, there was an audience, you know, for traditional jazz, even though everyone seemed to be, you know, into swing music at that time, Benny Goodman and Artie Shaw and Duke Ellington and Basie and so on and so forth. So it's, 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 it's a very kind of, um, there, there are no absolutes in this. Um, that's what I think I'm trying to say, you know, and, and when we go back to history, for, you know, for, for precedent of that, you know, that it was never the big band era. They were traditional musicians getting dusted down in who, who actually, some of whom played with Buddy Bolden, and they were, they were being, being sought out by you know, jazz historians and pushed onto the stage with a new set of false teeth in some cases. Uh, and there was an audience for this, you know, and, uh, Eddie Condon um, uh, was at his zenith at this particular time. So, this, you know, there's always been a lot going on in jazz and the audiences were, you know, I mean, jazz is a niche music, but it splits down into niches and niches and niches, uh, you know, right the way through its history. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your observations. Uh, one uh, result of the pandemic is that we get to see everybody's working rooms <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, could you share uh, your the projects you're working on currently? Um, the, the, the project I'm working on currently is uh, updating uh, my Elevich Gerald um, guitar. Uh, this this was, I think, the seventh reprint, which came out in Craggy, I don't know, um, some years ago, uh, 2004. Uh, that was updated last in 2004 and um, a university press, a respectable university press in uh, New York um, did a three book deal with me and they wanted uh, me to uh, update three books, starting with Ella Fitzgerald, uh, then going on to uh, Billie Holiday and then the last one in three years time, I hope, uh, will be my history of jazz rock. So each one uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to second guess myself and correct, you know, any small errors and, and, and perhaps modify my opinion with the passage of time. And, um, and also, uh, we naturally, being curious beings, accumulate a lot of research, um, perhaps in the expectation of, of, of wanting to update it, you know, because, you know, you own, whatever you do, you take track of it. I write that and I must try and improve it in some way. And so we have files of, 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 of stuff which I could then sort of add in, you know, um, as I say, starting with Ella Fitzgerald, which um, was quite interesting because uh, they, the, the original files which I wrote were on floppy disk. You remember floppy disk? This is probably before you were born. Can you still you know, read it? Can you still read it? Co computers, uh, and um, I had to get, uh, I had to find someone who uh, could actually convert them um, uh, to, you know, uh, in my case, um, Apple Apple text. And it was. And it turned out that the, the, there was one expert in the country at Cambridge University. And I tracked him down, and um, he finally was able to do it for me. So that, that, that was a story in itself, because I got having to type, retype them in the year, plus update, it was a bit of a, a long dance. Mr. Felder? Um, I'm not a freelancer anymore, as I used to be, as uh, Stuart Nicholson is. I'm employed at uh, Austrian National Broadcasting Corporation, like you, Piotr, on uh, Saturday in the beginning, and this work um, absorbs me quite well. I hope you can say that in a bit. 
Mm -hmm. So I am responsible for six, uh, for nine programs altogether and for six programs as a coordinator. At the moment, we have a festival running in uh, Krems in Lower Austria, which is called Fiat und Verkehrt, and we are um, doing live transmissions every evening. And I'm preparing for a um, jazz night program, which is a seven hours program taking place every weekend. Um, so, and uh, apart from that, we have the possibility, um, the opportunity for activities like concert series for young musicians in Austria, putting out CDs celebrating the Jazz Day on April the 13th. The, the whole um, day, the program of the radio channel AI, which I'm looking for, um, is full of jazz. So this daily work um, keeps me keeps me busy in a way. Um, I hope you forgive me, Piotr, if I um, come back to one of the points of our original discussion of um, Please do. and speaking of cipher. Please do. Because it, it's, um, it's interesting to me. I completely understand, Stuart, and I agree with you that um, the 60s were kind of emancipation of European jazz. So um, also from my perspective, from my perception, there were many musicians who did not want to sound anymore like American musicians. They wanted to do their own thing um, because of political reasons, because of musical reasons. Um, my point is just that um, things are not that easy to classify. I also want to add, it's, it's clear, jazz has always been very diverse. So um, if you identify a style or a new movement, you have the counterpart, you have a counterpart to that at any time in jazz. That's clear. But of course, as journalists, we try to identify the uh, newer and uh, relevant and interesting um, developments. Um, I think just classifications, national classifications are not that easy. Um, uh, um, for example, in the 1960s, when British jazz also um, emancipated from um, American jazz, Stuart, I'm sure you know it much better than me. I know that the music of a uh, um, uh, composer like Anton von Weber, who was not British at all, um, was very important for the, uh, for the spontaneous music ensemble of John Stevens, for example. He um, reduced American influence, for example. So it was not um, to be sound, to, to sound in a way British. Or um, in the Dutch music scene around instant composers pool, uh, with musicians like Han Benning and Willem Breike, they were drawing inspiration from, from different uh, kinds of genres. And it was uh, from, they, did, they in, included marches and circus music and uh, uh, songs from different directions in their music. It was an early kind of eclecticism, even postmodernism, I would say. Uh, it was unique for Dutch um, jazz musicians, but was it really some kind of Dutch jazz um, concerning the origins of that music? So that's why I'm a bit cautious also with um, categorizations like Slavic um, jazz, because um, if, it's, if it's really uh, uh, an intentional um, relation that the musicians themselves um, hear and think of in the music, it's fine. If it's something that um, is put from the outside on the music because something sounds a bit melancholic um, or elegiac, uh, then I'm a bit cautious. So just to um, just to explain a bit more what I meant. With, uh, yes, uh, I mean, you make a very good point, um, uh, particularly when it comes to Willem Droika and uh, Han Benek. And, and they, but what, the interesting thing about that is that they were making music which uh, wasn't happening anywhere else. That, that this, the, the William Broker Collective uh, didn't have, a, a, there wasn't one band in the world sounding like William Broker's Collective. And, uh, and, and, and so one could say that because of that, you know, it, it was Dutch now whether uh, whether he um, is, is on record uh, 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 tr consciously trying not to sound American, but bringing in lots of lots of uh, you know uh, various in, uh, ex 
eclectic influences into the music. Um, but, but it comes out with it's something that is quite unique to William Breuker and, and, and unique, to, unique to Holland. Um, whilst on the, on, on the other hand, you, you've got, for example, something that is uh, readily identifiable as South African township jazz. I mean, you wouldn't mistake that for, um, you wouldn't mistake that for Hungarian jazz or French jazz. You know, it's, it's got a specific, that's, that's what it is. Now, whether, as, as you say, they, they were consciously trying to not sound American, I, I very much doubt they, they just wanted to play it in a way that made sense, you know, to them and, and their, their, their local surroundings. Same as Nigerian highlife music, you know, which started out as, you know, big band music, and they just wanted to jive it up a bit with electric guitars and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, it, it, it's very interesting, you, you know, you, would, you might go to Portugal and you would hear jazz musicians incorporating the fado. Um, I was in Barcelona about six years ago and young musicians uh, uh, were sort of inc incorporating elements from their local culture, you know. Um, and they would do it, you know, they would have a composition where they would bring in their, their, their own elements, but for the rest of the time they were mostly playing, you know, what we would sort of say is a, a sort of a broadly sort of uh, post-bop mainstream type of jazz. But all of a sudden, you know, there, there were suddenly these flamenco fl flourishes and the rhythms of uh, emulating castanets on the rims of the drums and, 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 and there could be no mistaking, you know, where you know where that that comes from and I, I, it just struck me then you know that these these musicians want to show that they're Spanish <laughs> and they were just right that's it 10 minutes over and they could continue you know but I, I stress that the the the, the flamenco influences are done and it's extremely you know post uh, post pop style you know it was very very clever and, and very very thoughtful um, and I just celebrate these things. And it makes me laugh sometimes out loud because it's so wonderful to, you know, to see jazz being pushed in so many different directions, you know, um, and, and yet still, you know, it's, it's part of the overall language of jazz, but it also um, can be a, 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 a means of uh, local, expressing local and cultural identity. You know, and when we say cultural, you know, a, a good example there would be the, the you know the flamenco in, 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 that these young lads were doing in in, in Barcelona. So uh, yes, ex exciting times. But the trouble is, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you you uh, confronted with this. I wouldn't say a problem, but each each week brings you know maybe a pile of CDs about so big to me, and and you know particularly you know in the traditional. Uh, you know, record releasing periods, you know, which would be leading up to Christmas, we've got a pile like this, you know, um, uh, at the end of the month. And, 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 and I try and do due diligence, as the Americans would say, uh, but so much of it sounds the same, and so much of it sounds uh, post uh, music college stuff, that, that this is what we've learned, and we are reiterating it. And some people may be doing something a little bit daring, like time no changes, you know, and think that this is, you know, who would have thought, you know, uh, of doing time no changes, in, you know, in this day and age, so to speak, you know, that they were being original. But, you know, there's so many musicians, you know, sort of going back to early Miles Davis and, um, uh, you know, with a second grade uh, quintet and, and others. Um, I, 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 are trying to explore free jazz in, 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 in interesting and different ways and not realizing that you know you know this 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 crowd of French musicians are doing exactly the same and these Hungarian musicians are actually doing something very similar to it this this is I, I, I would say a, a product of the marginalization effect of, of jazz education. And, and, and as I said before, you know, it, it, it owes a lot to, you know, American models. And so there is a sort of a similar, similarity of both of, of, of approach. 
and uh, and execution in, in an awful lot of uh, you know jazz which I'm I'm hearing and um, and my goodness you know um, now that it, 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 we're trying to get past the COVID thing in some way shape or form without too much success um, but we're getting lots of solo albums because people have been locked up in their locked up in their rooms like this you know and, and decided to to record their, 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 their natural inclination is to create and, and document where they are at this particular point in time you know and uh, and, and so that, that too is a, you know a, a reflection of the times we're in you know an absolute inundation of, of, of solo one albums or or albums that have been you know the tapes I'm sending you you know uh, the digital file of this, would you please add, you know, bass to this and, and, and send it to the drummer and, 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 and this kind of thing. So, so uh, invention is not going to be quashed by uh, COVID, I don't think. It's, 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 it's jazz is alive <laughs> and kicking. Jazz is alive. That's a good uh, ending point. Professor Nicholson, thank you very much. Uh, best of luck in converting the floppy, floppy files. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Felber, let's hope the public broadcasters uh, are still interested in jazz for the years to come. <laughs> yes, thank you. We Gentlemen, thank you interview. very much for joining us uh, today. Stay safe, best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> and thank you, yes, and nice to see you, Andreas. <laughs> nice to see you.